In this video, I will be proving the functional equation and the analytic continuation of the zeta function. In the last video, what we discovered was that zeta of z is equal to zeta of 1 minus z, and it could be continued for z an element of the complex numbers. So it's analytically continued to the entire complex plane. And uh, this is, of course, for zeta of z which for a real part of z bigger than 1 is going to be equal to 1 half z times z minus 1 times pi to the negative 1 half z times gamma of 1 half z times zeta of z. And because we have this analytic continuation on xi here, we can continue it for zeta here. So the theorem is zeta of z can be analytically continued to uh, c removing 1. So all complex numbers except for 1. And then we also have the functional equation. So this is also part of the theorem. All right, so now the expression we're going to use for zeta should be pretty obvious. It's going to be xi of z divided by all of this. So it's 1 half z times z minus 1 times pi to the negative 1 half z times a gamma of 1 half z. So now let's go through every single piece of this and verify whether it's analytic on c or not. Xi of z, analytic on all of c. That's what we just talked about. Right here, 1 over 1 half z times z minus 1 is analytic except for 1. So this is for c removing 1. So that's why we have to have the c removing 1 here. It's because it's right there. Now 1 over pi to the negative 1 half z, that's analytic for every value. Now 1 over gamma, so this function, is actually analytic on the entirety of the complex plane. Now why is it analytic on the entirety of the complex plane? Well it's because gamma is analytic on c removing all of the negative integers in 1. So 0, negative 1, negative 2, so on and so forth. So it's not analytic on these values. However, it has poles at each of these values. So each of these values are poles. And they're actually simple poles. Which means that 1 over that function has simple zeros. So 1 over gamma has simple zeros on the same set. So instead of the poles, which are basically go to infinity, 1 over infinity is 0. And so it has simple zeros on the negative integers and 1. So not only are the poles removed from gamma, but also gamma is never 0, ever. So gamma when you do 1 over it, it's fine because it's never going to go to infinity, and thus it's analytic on the entirety of the complex plane. So that's why this entire thing is analytic for c removing 1, and thus we can continue the zeta function. Now the thing I'm going to do next is just plug in 1 minus z. And I think the reasoning behind this is obvious. It's because of this fact. So then we're going to have xi of 1 minus z divided by 1 half 1 minus z times 1 minus z minus 1, which is just negative z. Uh, and then obviously that becomes z times z minus 1. And then times pi to the negative 1 half times 1 minus z. And then multiply that by gamma of 1 half 1 minus z. Now we can use this identity to make this numerator just become xi of z. And of course, xi of z is going to be this. So let's just plug that in for xi of z. It's 1 half z times z minus 1 times pi to the negative 1 half z times gamma of 1 half z. And then there's an extra zeta, which I'll just cut off at the end. All right, well, right there, the 1 halves cancel. Right there, the z's cancel. Right there, the z minus 1's cancel. Now, these two can combine. 
So the pi to the negative 1 half z and the pi to the negative 1 half times 1 minus z. So we have pi to the negative 1 half z. And I'm going to multiply this by the negative of that exponent. So it's pi to the 1 half minus a half z. Because I just moved it from the denominator to the numerator by getting rid of that negative sign. And then we can just add the numerators to get pi to the 1 half minus a half z minus a half z is just z. So let's combine our, all of these. And then we have pi to the 1 half minus z times right here we have gamma of 1 half z over gamma of 1 half minus a half z. And then we multiply that all by zeta of z. Now, this right here is pretty hard to simplify unless you know some identities. So the identities I'm going to use is that gamma of z times gamma of 1 minus z is actually equal to pi over sine of pi z. And I'm also going to use the fact that gamma of z times gamma of z plus a half is, and this is, a, this is a really weird one, is equal to 2 to the 1 minus 2z times the square root of pi times gamma of 2z. So if I have proofs of these, they'll be up there in the i card. And so now let's just apply both of these theorems. Let's focus our attention on this part. So if we focus our attention on that part, we have pi to the 1 half minus z. And to make use of both of these identities, I'm going to take what we have so far with the gammas. And I'm just going to multiply it by gamma of 1 half z plus a half over gamma of 1 half z plus a half. And so this combines them into these two. And right here, we have 1 half z and 1 half z plus a half, which is this identity right here. And then I have 1 half minus a half z, so 1 half minus a half z. And let's do 1 minus 1 half minus a half z. This gives us 1 minus a half plus a half z, which is just equal to 1 half plus a half z, which is right there. And so this argument right here is the argument in this identity right there. And so we just use both of those identities to get pi to the 1 half minus z times on the top we're going to have this identity. So it's going to be 2 to the 1 minus 2z. However, the argument is actually 1 half z. So 2 times a half z is just z. Multiply that by the square root of pi, and then multiply it again by gamma of 2z is 2 times a half z, which is just z. Now divide by this identity, which is using this. And the argument is 1 half minus a half z. So we have pi divided by sine of pi 1 half minus a half z. So now we can simplify this quite a bit. It's going to be pi to the 1 half minus z times, I'm going to pull out square root of pi over pi is pi to the 1 half minus 1, which is pi to the negative a half, which then gets rid of the half there, it just makes this pi to the negative z. All right, then we have 2 to the 1 minus z. And then we have sine of pi, which I'm going to distribute it, pi over 2, minus 1 half pi z, and multiply that by gamma of z. That's what we have. Fun fact is that there's a relationship between cosine of z and sine of z. And it's that we do sine of pi over 2 minus z, we get cosine of z. And this is because in a right triangle, 
we have an angle z here. And then the angle opposing it is pi over 2 minus c. Now if I have a, b, c, the cosine of z is going to be a over c. And the sine of pi over 2 minus z, which is right across from it, is also a over c. And so we use that identity, which you learned a long time ago, to receive our final result, which is that zeta of 1 minus z from right here is equal to pi to the negative z times 2 to the 1 minus z times cosine of 1 half pi z using that fact we did below, pi over 2 minus that gives us that times gamma of z times zeta of z. And this is the functional equation. Whew. That's the end of that proof. Now, I'm going to prove that in fact that integral we had last time was analytic. Now I'm going to use a theorem of which I will not prove in this video, although I will prove in my complex analysis series. And the theorem says that if I have a function which is from u, an open subset of the complex numbers, Cartesian product with d, which is a a measurable subspace of Rm, so this is a an open subspace of C, and this is an open subspace of Rm, and we send this into the complex numbers. So we have a complex variable, and then we have just a real variable, which we'll call x. We have this function right here, and we have some certain properties of it. One, that f is measurable, a uh, Lebesgue measurable. Two, that for every single fixed element of this uh, measurable subspace of Rm, um, the function g of z, which is equal to f of zx, so this function right here is analytic. So if we have that, and three, that there exists a function m, a, a measurable function m, which takes you from d into the real numbers, such that the absolute value of f of zx is less than or equal to the absolute value of m of x for every z an element of the complex numbers and x. And now the property of this m is that the integral of m, uh, dl, so the Lebesgue integral of m, over your measurable subspace is less than infinity. So it converges. So the integral of m converges. And all of this tells us that the integral over the region d which we are talking about, of the function f of zx, and we're fixing the z, so this is for a fixed z, so f of z equals that. z is fixed, dlm, so the Lebesgue integral, dimension m, where x is the variable we're talking about. So integrating this in respect to x, is analytic. And that's the theorem. Basically what it proves is that something like the integral we had last time, which is the integral from 1 to infinity of omega of u times u to the z over 2 minus 1 plus e u to the negative z over 2 minus a half du. Of course we actually have to apply the theorem. Now I'm going to apply this theorem for u, this, um, the set in the theorem, to be equal to the ball around the origin of radius capital A. So basically we're taking all of the values for which the 
the magnitude of z is less than a. And this is for arbitrary a. a can be however large you want it to be. And the reason why this then proves it's true for the entire complex plane is because a is arbitrarily large. And so there's always going to be some a such that that z will have the magnitude less than a. And therefore, we will have it that it's analytic for every single z because it's analytic for this arbitrary a. Now you'll see why we have to have that arbitrary a in a little bit. Now one, that it's measurable, well, <laughs> it's trivial. It's pretty obvious. And I'll just, I guess I'll leave it to you, but like it's the easiest thing in the world to prove that it's measurable. Two, for every single point in this space, we fix it, then that function is analytic. Well, if we think about it, if we fix the u, this is just an exponential function. This is a constant, that's a constant, that's a constant. It's just an exponential function, which is analytic, so it's trivial again. Now number three is where we actually have to think. Now the fact that we use here that omega of u is equal to e to the negative pi u plus e to the negative 4 pi u plus e to the negative 9 pi u, so on and so forth. It's just going up the squares here. And what you can prove pretty easily is that all of these things is less than or equal to e to the negative pi u. That's pretty gosh darn easy to prove. And so just adding these two up, using the inequality again, we have 2 e to the negative pi u. It's that simple for that one. And then for the other function, which is u to the z over 2 minus 1 plus u to the negative z over 2 minus 1, we use this fact and the fact that these are exponential functions. Because they're exponential functions, they're monotonous, meaning that because we have the magnitude of z is less than a, then I can just preserve that less than and plug in a. So u to the a over 2 minus 1 plus u to the negative a over 2 minus 1. And then this right here is pretty obviously less than or equal to u to the a over 2 minus 1. Sorry, this is 1 half. And so that's pretty obviously less than or equal to that. And so I can just say it's less than or equal to 2 times u to the a over 2 minus 1, just adding them together. And so, just multiplying them together, m of u will be equal to 4 u to the a over 2 minus 1 times e to the negative pi u. Alright, what about the integral of m? So the integral over the space that we're integrating over, which is 1 to infinity. So we have 1 to infinity of m, which is 4 we have e to the negative pi u times u to the a over 2 minus 1 du. Well, look at this. This is less than or equal to 4 times the integral from 1 to infinity of e to the negative u on its own because we're, we're increasing the exponent by getting rid of the amount it's negative by. So it's just e to the negative u times u to the a over 2 minus 1 du, which is just gamma. So this is equal to 4 gamma of a over 2. And so it converges because the integral of m is less than or equal to 4 gamma of a over 2, and so therefore it's less than infinity. And because m converges by this theorem, that integral is analytic. So in case you forgot what we did in this video, we proved the functional equation for zeta, and we proved that xi is definitively analytic by proving that the integral we had last time was analytic for arbitrary balls of radius a, which extends it to in the entirety of c, making this theorem true, making everything true. Oh, oh that's it. Oh, that's it.